Hello everyone. Welcome to the Earth's second chakra and the second chakra discussion. My name is Reverend Dr. Tracy Allshafer and I am excited to be introducing very soon to you a gentleman who I have come to know and love so much, um, Peruvian um, from tour operator to mystic to shaman in his own right, Jorge Luis Delgado. So I have my, um, my background set up to talk to him about the location of the Earth's second chakra, which is Lake Titicaca. And I had a tremendous opportunity to visit this area of the world in 2015. And I feel, uh, and, and it's been discussed by many people, that the Earth's second chakra um, definitely is that Lake Titicaca area, which is bordered by Peru and Bolivia, but that, that it is very expansive to the areas even to Machu Picchu and Sacred Valley all along uh, Peru, where there are so many power places. Um, and that's certainly been my experience. Um, but I want to talk to you more about the second chakra and the energy of the second chakra. So for those of you who are not familiar with the chakras, our second chakra is located at what we call the sacral plexus or our, um, our womb area, uh, is associated to the second chakra, which is the name is Swadhisthana, translates to one's dwelling place. Uh, Swadhisthana has been translated many different ways, but mostly we think of it as being uh, sweetness, uh, the translation of sweetness. So we have this direct connection to the water element in the second chakra. And uh, to me, that dripping of that nectar, that honey, um, goes along with that sweetness quality and I feel very strongly this chakra has been a, an emotionally charged chakra. The emotions are directly linked here. I have found over my 20 some years of teaching the chakras and working with people through yoga practices and yoga teacher trainings, the second chakra tends to be the one that is the most difficult, the most challenging to work through because it's linked to our emotional center and uh, one of my teachers once uh, referred to it as the emotional garbage cans. There's me we have a plethora of emotions. Emotion our emotional realm, our emotional identity is is humongous, and the good or what we would define as good emotions like um, happiness and joy and love, those are the ones we want to celebrate and talk about all the time. Uh, we want to feel those in our body. In fact, the right of the second chakra is to feel and have pleasure so that anything we define as pleasurable, we, we want to really explore and we want to talk about and we want to share with others and we want to invite in. But our emotional realm is complete of our human experience. And so there are some emotions that we would refer to sometimes as or judge as negative or, or dark or um, I've heard them referred to as our shadow. And these are the emotions like anger and jealousy and rage and um, all the things that we don't like to say that we feel, right? Anything that somehow in our mind we've conceived to be a negative experience or something we don't want people to know we think about or feel because we want to appear to be, you know, this great... <laughs> happy person or this person that speaks from love. And um, so if we don't want to show all those, ah, ah, the negative or how we would perceive these, these shadow aspects of ourself, and yet they exist. So what do we do with them? Because they're real and we feel them and they come up. So when they're real and we feel them and they come up, but we're at work or we're with um, people that we don't feel comfortable experiencing them with or, or sharing them with is that we shove them down. We shove those experiences down. We try to, we try to pretend they're not there. Sometimes we try to ignore them and we push them down. And what happens is they literally energetically con collect in our hip area, in our hip and our low back. 
So if you've had an extremely emotional day, emotionally charged day, had a very difficult experience and you weren't able to feel it and process it, you're probably going to have a very sore low back. Um, my low back has gone out after a big argument with a friend that I had once. And that was the beginning of a very long period of time where I was working through that connection with my hips and my low back and where I stored all of these um, emotions that I felt were raw or, or negative or damaging to my character, whatever I was feeling that they would be. So this experience with my friend kind of dislodged a lot of stuff that I had packed down there in my hips and my lower back. And I was able to start to feel that again. And we're talking years and years of stuffing stuff down there that I felt like I couldn't explore or couldn't talk about. It wasn't appropriate. Um, some traumas that I didn't want to admit had happened to me. And it, it just all started bubbling up. And I was able to use this period of time in my life to really discover what was going on there. So that is difficult work. And a lot of people aren't ready to do that difficult work. That's why this chakra is so significant and important, yet so challenging, so difficult and so challenging to work through. So it can be the most pleasurable, enjoyable, fun, wonderful chakra, or it can be this hard, difficult chakra. And think of the element water and all of the aspects of water, right? We have, we have like a still pond, right? It's very reflective, um, very meditative, very peaceful maybe. Um, and then you have, you know, you have this little river or um, lakes that have like some movement in them. You have the mother, you have the, the ocean, the mother goddess, right? The ocean with the waves and the under the tide and the undertow and all of the things that go with the ocean, um, the mysteries and the depth, these amazing waterfalls with rushing water, just charging down, um, forcing cleansing, forcing energy to flow through and rapids and so there's a such, such a dynamic level to water. And it's the same with our emotions. You know, there's the calm emotions and then there's the crazy, <laughs> like out of this world emotions. And, and some of us really, really explore them and feel them. And some of us go, hmm, I'm not supposed to act that way. I'm not supposed to, you know, good girls don't do that. Or um, a real lady wouldn't, you know, say that or um, all of the stuff, right? All of the stuff. And you know that you know your stuff. I don't have to tell you your stuff, the stuff that we were um, indoctrined into with our life. So second chakra, water. In fact, I want to talk about um, the word samskara. Samskara are, are, are mental impressions. And in the yoga practice, the yogis, they they had talked about how the second chakra is a very difficult energy to move through because of this, because of these some scars, because they contain, because they contain unconscious desires, unconscious desires. So there's all this stuff that is just sitting deep down there that we don't want to explore. And they, until they're brought to light, until we bring them to the surface, right? We have to dig down into the belly of the lake and pull them up to the surface. And then when we allow them to come to the surface, we can really start to talk about them, feel them, move them out. So you might feel like uh, at, you have very strict or rigid movements. You know, you see people sometimes walking and like, you know, they go like this and, you know, it's very choppy or, or restrictive. And then you see these other people that are just so fluid, right? And they're and they move gracefully with their body, and and they're not prohibited in any way. So that is this this fluid quality that's moving through effortlessly, or not. We have all the realms within there. So uh, the color of the second chakra is orange. Um, 
So if you remember the first chakra was red, second chakra was orange, and the second chakra is uh, the right to feel and have pleasure. The right to feel and have pleasure. So we have a lot of connection to joy and pleasure and happiness in this chakra. And um, so this leads for some people into the realm of addiction. We like those feelings, so we want more of them. And for some people, there's no boundary there. There's no, no way to, to stop. You just keep going. So, so having uh, the emotional intelligence and the ability to, you know, to set those appropriate boundaries. So I know, okay, if I love chocolate, I can have a bite of chocolate or a little piece of chocolate. And it's like, oh my God, the sweetness, the nectar that was in there, the, the juiciness. Whew, I, it was so pleasurable and I love that experience. And, you know, thank you, goddess, for that. Whew, that was amazing. And then there are other people, they get that taste of chocolate and they're like, oh my God, I got to have more, I got to have more, I got to have more. Uh, and just keep feeding that, feeding that energy of, that sweetness, it's so good, I can't, I can't stop. Um, and we can say that about just about anything because addiction can be to anything, to anything that you feel pleasurable. And for some people that's even negative experiences. Some people are addicted to negative or lower vibrational heavy energy. And they, f they somehow in their mechanism, in their, in their being feed off of that. So I know this is like a lot, it's a lot to take in. And this chakra can just dive really, really deep because the location in the sacral plexus is where all of our sexual organs are as well. So uh, disorders of the body in the second chakra are gonna be based around all those organs, um, the spleen, um, the yeah, that lower bowel, that's a part of the second chakra. The areas of, if you're, if you're a man, the testes, um, if you're a woman, the ovaries. So any kind of sexual dysfunction um, from menstrual difficulties to complete menstrual, uh, to complete sexual dysfunction for men or women, anywhere in there, having trouble conceive, um, you name it. Like anything you can think of revolving those organs of the body and disorders of those are going to come from the water element not flowing through, you not being able to maybe get in touch with those emotions in that emotional realm and to fluidly move through those samskaras. So when we go to Lake Titicaca, when I went to Lake Titicaca in 2015, it was an incredibly difficult experience. It was a, an, a, an immensely enjoyable, beautiful experience. And then it was an incredibly difficult experience. And it was all about me diving into the deep waters of some of the things I didn't really want to go to. I wanted it to just be this amazing, magical, mystical, perfect experience. And then when I was challenged by the lake to really see clearly some things. I had a really tough time navigating through those waters. It was a challenge. So Lake Titicaca can be a blessing, a healing, a cleansing for such on such a deep level. And, and it is such an amazing connection to the navel. It's called the navel of the earth. And it is um, the Incas believe the birthplace of uh, the Incan peoples, and ho hopefully I'll get into that with Jorge. Um, but I definitely encourage you to explore here because so much healing can occur when you work with this chakra. I'm not saying it's easy. It is not easy. It is, it is one of the most difficult chakras you'll work with. The healing, the healing that can come here is so incredible. And at the end of the day, we do want our life to be pleasurable and enjoyable. We do. We, we want to experience all the wonderful things. We became humans so that we could experience all the stuff. But mostly, we wanted to experience love, immense love, 
and immense joy. But if we don't honor those shadow aspects, if we don't work through some of that kar karma and some saras and all the difficulties, we'll never understand or know the love and the joy. So let's dive into the Earth's second chakra, Lake Titicaca. Flowing down from the Earth's first chakra at the base of Mount Shasta, a major ley line of the planet known as the Plumed Serpent or Great Male Dragon flows directly into the waters of Lake Titicaca, anchoring in the world's second chakra. This massive waterway is commonly referred to as the highest navigatable lake in the world. At such a surface elevation of 3,812 meters, 12,507 feet, this largest freshwater lake in South America not only boasts staggering nautical qualities, but unmatched energetic properties as well. The second chakra, Swadhisthana, literally means one's own residence, but it also translates to sweetness. Its purpose is that of movement and connection and equates to our emotional identity and the right to feel and to have pleasure in life. In the human body, it is located at the sacral plexus or the area of the hips, lower back, and pelvis. As this area in the human being houses the sexual organs and the womb, we often find it referred to as the birthplace of creation and creativity. And Lake Titicaca is often referred to as the womb of the Mother Earth. Water is the element associated with the second chakra. In Ayurveda, Laguna, or quality of water, is liquid, soft, oily, and cool. The karma, or action, is that of cleansing and cohesiveness. And with the water element, we find immediate connections to all life. Approximately 71% of the Earth's surface is water. Each human consists of about 60% water. Water is the single most significant element, quality, substance for the creation, birthing, and sustaining of all life. And as the second chakra connects to the water element, so does it to Mother Moon and her many elucidations, like that of illuminating what was formerly dark. Situated on the eastern section of Lake Titicaca, nearest to the Bolivian border town of Copacabana, in the largest island on the lake, Isla del Sol, or Island of the Sun, rests a stone simply known as the Titicaca Stone. Some say that this is the exact location of the center of the Earth's second chakra. Island of the Sun is also known as the navel of the world. Others indicate that there is no exact location, but is more the entire area emanating from Titicaca in and around Peru and Bolivia. Perhaps the best known peoples of the land are the Incas. This thriving empire ruled the area of Lake Titicaca since 1100. However, the pre-Incan Empire can be traced back to roughly 2500 BC. In the Incan mythology, there is an interesting creation story involving Lake Titicaca. In my friend Jorge Luis Delgado's book, Inca Wisdom, he says, Where did the first seed of union between men, women, heaven and earth germinate? Where did the dissoluble union between Father, Son, and Mother Earth originate? Where did stellar life, the light beings, and life on Earth, the children of the Sun, begin? Their birthplace was Lake Titicaca, the eternal city. Here, Father, Son, and Mother Earth received a cosmic spark from Pachatata, 
Divine Father, and Pachamama, Divine Mother, to unite them, joining heaven and earth. This transcendental link has never been broken because Lake Titicaca remains a fruitful creator. It continues to send the energy of awakening and transformation to the world. Lake Titicaca is a major energy portal. Not only does the plumed serpent ley line run directly into the Earth's second chakra here, but it is one of only two locations on the planet where two major ley lines intersect. The second great female dragon line, or rainbow serpent, flows downward from the Earth's fourth chakra in the United Kingdom and directly to the second chakra here. Therefore, the energy of Titicaca embodies both the balance of male and female energies, as well as the first chakra's foundational energy and that of the fourth chakra's energy of unconditional love. It is no wonder that this gorgeous place is considered to be the world center for the creation of all life. It is interesting to note that the second location on the planet where both of these major ley lines converge is in Bali, Indonesia, another fascinating power place that I was truly blessed to visit two times. And while Bali is not indicated as a planetary chakra, it is situated directly between the Earth's third and seventh chakras with very powerful spiritual energies uniting in its own distinct way. And we will revisit that another time. I plunged into the waters of Lake Titicaca in 2015 after a gorgeous journey through the Incan ruins of Machu Picchu and Sacred Valley, home of the Quechua peoples of the Andes Mountains. I took a day-long bus ride south towards Lake Titicaca. Second chakra being all things emotions, movement and fluidity, and ultimately pleasure, I can wholeheartedly testify that my journey here was a thorough inventory of my entire emotional realm. I can now only attempt to take you with me on a moving surf through pictures and story. The exploration of my inner emotional body began in the outer realms of Lake Titicaca on the Euros floating islands. The Euros people construct their homes on reeds floating in the lake. It is said that the ancestors of the Euros lived on these reeds before the birth of the sun in the dark ages before. These man-made islands allow the inhabitants to immerse into living at one with the water. Bursting with creativity, the Euros people have not only found a way to make a living out of selling weavings and handicrafts, but have created their own sustainable individual islands. It was an interesting feeling being on the Reed Islands. With no firm ground underneath, how does one feel grounded? I feel perhaps the invitation here is to live and embody full fluidity. Although walking on the reeds is fairly firm, there is a sensation of everything being mobile and impermanent. In fact, my tour guide explained that the reason they cannot confirm exactly how many floating islands exist in Euros, but only give approximates, is because when there is an altercation or argument within a family that cannot be resolved, they will cut through the reed and separate the family thus making two islands from one. While in Euros, I experienced a dreaming ceremony where floating on the lake, lying in a reed boat, I was guided to recall all my fears and negative emotions from the past and to be with them. Perhaps because it felt reminiscent of being in the womb, it was a comfortable and relaxing experience visualizing these lower energies being cut off and floating away. I felt a sincere cleansing and releasing of the energy. From Euros, I traveled by boat to the island of Tequile, 
which was a quite different experience. Waitakile's shores sit at 12,959 feet. The highest point on the summit's village sits at 13,287 feet, where it feels like you are just seated at the top of the world. And although the island is a solid foundation, the task of climbing 500 steps up to the village feels quite arduous for those not acclimated to the altitude. I needed to stop many times, only to be easily passed by female elders who quite effortlessly carried extraordinary amounts of goods in a large sack on their back while hiking right up. Once at the Acropolis, I enjoyed watching a celebration with the locals of Tequila, witnessing community come together. Looking out from the top of the village to the waters below, my cup felt quite full with an overall sense of happiness, ease, and joy. The difference in energy between Euros and Tequila has all to do with that solid foundation. While both islands proved to be ultimately connected to the pleasures of life, Tequila's vertical separation from the lake provides a more secure feeling, where Euros assuredly requires one to detach, trust, and live in the flow of the ever-changing surf of life. With that feeling of safety and security in Tequila, I experienced a rebirthing ceremony. After cleansing with flower water, a meditation revealed my new spiritual name. Trakara floated in through my crown and down into my sacral chakra, where I feel it is still inhabiting a lengthy incubation period. I suppose that I have taken a note from my Euros friends and released any need for it to be anything more than that and what it may wish to reveal to me in its own divine timing. Crossing the border into Bolivia, my guide secured a boat at La Paz and made passage for Island of the Moon, Isla de la Luna, where there was a noticeable shift from community and celebration to solitude and introspection. Island of the Moon is said to be where the first women came the legendary Inca goddess Mama Kile. Many of the island's structures were built pre-Incan by the Aymara culture, and as such, some of the meanings of these ancient structures are unclear, yet are unequivocally feminine, based in the energy of fertility and creative power. In Incan times, chosen women known as the Virgins of the Sun lived monastically on the island studying and performing ceremonies. There, I am told by my guide, this is your island. And I felt a deep sense of honor and privilege to be amongst the many priestesses of the past as I performed my own ceremony there. My meditation on Moon Island led me into a vaster understanding of my true self and left me feeling powerful beyond measure. I could literally feel vital pranic life force energy flowing throughout my entire body, propelling me forward for the next and most difficult part of the journey on the lake. As with all things in motions, the tide eventually does turn. And so it did for my trip to Island of the Sun, unanimously claimed to be the most powerful place on Lake Titicaca. As the largest island on the lake, Sun Island is regarded as the home of the supreme Incan god Inti and served in part as a training center for Incan priests. Many myths and legends abound here regarding it being the birthplace of man and yes, the feeling is decidedly masculine. I heard it once said, with great power comes great responsibility. As such, one does not merely tour Island of the Sun. One rather takes a deep dive into the dark caverns of the soul 
testing faith and challenging one to experience all the unpleasant stuff yet having it be for one's ultimate healing. With a pending storm moving in, the water and the energy shifted abruptly, revealing personal shadow aspects of shame, guilt, grief, lies, illusion, attachment, and fear. Many things that I thought I'd previously worked through came swelling back to the surface, splashing directly into my face, forcing me to deal with them. This maddening, juxtaposed energy of what my inner world was revealing, while my outer world spotlit the magic of a shamanic ceremony by the Quechua elders on a stone altar, tossed my emotional self against the allegorical rocks. If Moon Island gave me power, then Sun Island forced me to realize the self-limiting beliefs I had about that power and to get real about truly cleansing and releasing these energies. But that's the thing about being at the Earth's second chakra, isn't it? There's an opportunity to scour emotions thoroughly for deeper understanding and to finally flush out any energy that no longer serves the highest self. The shadowy emotional realms of our being are difficult ones to reflect upon. But like the snake, who the Quechua people refer to as Uka Pacha, and believe helps us move into our inner world, we must find a way to release our heavy energy and bad emotions from the past so that we can shed our skin become lighter and truly become the children of the sun. For me personally, this trick took me to places that I had never expected. By tapping into the sacral chakra, energy became dislodged, propelling a huge spiritual awakening. Since 2015, I have returned to Peru to other times and I believed that the energy of the Earth's second chakra, the womb of the mother, the birthplace of Shakti, exists throughout the area as an integration of energy with the divine masculine, synchronizing in true birth through union of masculine and feminine polarities into oneness. The fascinating thing about a body of water is that when it is still, it becomes a mirror, and what you see in it is a reflection of your own true self. But when the waters are rough, the image becomes distorted, and we must then dive much deeper for true clarity. We have not even yet discussed the underwater ruins of mysterious origins found deep within Lake Titicaca. Since its first underwater archaeological exploration in 1956, these ancient submerged ruins, possibly an extension of the walls of the Temple of the Sun, were hypothesized by Professor Ruben Vela of the Tiwanaku Archaeological Institute to be sacred meeting places for religious pilgrim. And of course, we cannot discount the possible reference to it being the actual lost city of Atlantis. The fabled ancient civilization of spiritually advanced people who because of their greed and moral bankruptcy were eliminated by the gods who sank the entire city. And yes, there is another fascinating connection to the second chakra here. Swati Stana's sacred geometric diagram, the Yantra, is a six-petaled lotus flower representing mental disturbances or vrittis. These afflictive emotions are commonly listed as anger, hatred, lust, and greed, and are caused by avidya or ignorance to our own true nature, a disconnection from our truth and an obstacle to our spiritual evolution. So it would appear that the inhabitants of Atlantis fell prey to these afflictions 
and that it ultimately cost them their entire world. We too can easily lose ourselves in the pursuit of pleasures by overly focusing on the material world and sinking into the addictive depths of the sweetness in life. Like a buoy in a storm, it is easy to be thrashed about in the energy of the sacral chakra. But at the end of the day, when the storm does pass, the waters can ultimately cleanse and purify the body, mind, and soul to reveal the greatest truth, that the ultimate emotion is love. And once you can dwell in that space, unburdened by heavy energies from your past and unattached to the pleasures of the present, your second chakra will be clear, open, flowing, and capable of catapulting spiritual energy upward into the next chakra in the path. Mm. For a deeper understanding of the Earth's second chakra energy portal at Lake Titicaca, let's tune in to my recent discussion with Peruvian local businessman and Chacaruna bridge person, my friend, Jorge Luis Delgado. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me today, uh, Jorge. This is uh, my good, I'm so honored to call you my friend, Jorge Luis Delgado, who is a uh, Chacaruna bridge person and um, a Peruvian, um, I like to call you mystic. I don't know if you like that terminology or not, but um, Jorge, can you just say a little bit about who you are and um, your connection to the Earth's uh, second chakra, the sacral chakra at Lake Titicaca, because I know you have a, a very a big connection to that area. Uh, thank you, my friend. The honor is mine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity to share from the wisdom of the ancestors, the wisdom of the lake, the wisdom of this new time. You know, we have a, a great connection with the sacred Titicaca. And for us, it's the most holy place in the world, in the entire world. Because, you know, in our tradition, we believe that everything has a Ahayu. Ahayu is the soul, is the spirit. And those Ahayus are anchored in different places in the world. In the Andean world, the Ahayu of the Cosmic Mother, Divine Mother, the beloved Pachamama, it is anchored at the sacred Titicaca. So the sacred Titicaca is the place where is the flame of the Divine Mother. There is nothing, nothing, nothing more powerful than that flame than that love, that wisdom that is in service to all life. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything has to do with the Divine Mother. Our origins, the origins of the origins, you know? So mm -hmm. talking about the sacred Titicaca is talking about the Winnie Marca. What is Winnie Marca? Probably one of the old names of the sacred Lake Titicaca now, part of the lake now has the name of Winnie Marca. And I believe that all the lake once was called Winnie Marca, which means eternal city. Mm. And the eternal city are the places of the light beings, of the masters, of the eternal souls. So everybody, when we talk about home, we are talking about the eternal cities. And one of these places, the place of the origin of the Incas, the place of the origin of the Tiwanakus, Pucar, different cultures, you know, it's like the place of the genesis, mm -hmm. you know, the place of the origins. So that is so special. At the lake, we have so many gifts. There is so many 
uh, temples in this physical reality, but also in the inner world and the upper world. Mm. It's, uh, it's truly a magical place. I was so lucky to be there in 2015 with you uh, to visit some of the different islands um, and particularly uh, Island of the Sun and Island of the Moon. And I know there are a lot of different origin stories to uh, Island that equate Island of the Sun with, I think, the birthplace of the Incas and the birthplace of all life or all civilization. But um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how the connection to the to that being the Earth's second chakra and is it is it actually is there a, a physical location in one of the islands that seems to be the anchor point or do you feel like it's the whole area not even just of the lake but that might even be broader than that well you know there is a uh, different perceptions about the chakras of the world of course one strong theory it says you know this is uh, the, the the second chakra or the the, the the sexual or the womb and there are different and in our tradition in the inca or pre-inca we don't talk much about chakras mm -hmm. but we we talk about springs of energies what is a spring of energy is a pukyo pukyo is where for example where the water comes that water spring but also it's a spring of energy the other name we have for that is Anyawi, it's an eye. So this is a great eye of the mother, the mother earth observing the cosmic womb, the cosmic spiral, recording all that process of expansion. The other, the other point is a belt. So it's, no, it's not only one specific point, it's like our belt around the, the neck around the heart around the third eye so belts so it's a little bit different the perception of some specific point of course we will know those places nowadays as a power places what is power power is light so the place of light the place of love service and wisdom so whatever we want to do there it's possible to manifest. I mean, healings, expansion, uh, planting seeds in our, in our soul, in our hearts. Uh, we can do so many activities, but one of the most traditional legends talks about this is the womb, the womb of the Mother Earth, okay? Mm -hmm. As the womb of the Mother Earth, this is the birthplace of the children of the sun. You know, we believe that we are children of the Mother Earth and children of the Father. So the point is, from where that comes, that, that love, that relationship, it comes from deep, deep, deep love of Pachamama and Pachatata. Pachamama, Pachatata, Divine Mother, Divine Fathers, they love each other so, so, so much, okay? Mm. From that love, we come from the heart of the mother earth there is a filament that comes to the surface to this reality so from the heart of the divine mother a filament comes and we become as a caspe this is a caspe you are a caspe that's why it's so famous this this name or last name in peru caspe it's a caspe you know it's like a quartz like a a, a, a prism so i am a priest and a ray of the light comes from the Father Son and touches, and we let flow the luminosity of that light. That is the children of the sun. That is the Inca. So in, Inti is the sun. So from there comes In. Ka from Kana. Inca. So the Inca is that state of consciousness when we decide to let flow through our lives. That light that comes from Iyatixi Wiracochan. 
that's the primordial light. So when it happens in an easy, deeper level, it is at the sacred Titicaca, because there, between the bales and in the world, is more thin, fine. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. much easier as as to return to your own nature that is your soul, your spirit. We call the Ahayu. Hmm. Yeah, I, there's there's so much there <laughs> that you yes, just yes. said. No, we're going to go in different directions. <laughs> yeah. One thing I want to ask you about, though, because I've mentioned this to many people since I first met you in 2015, was that you had mentioned uh, Lake Titicaca, and I believe it's in one of your books, too, and maybe in Andean Awakening. I think you mention it, that Lake Titicaca is considered the womb of Pachamama and also uh, the seat of the feminine polarity on the planet. And that was something you talked to us quite a bit about. And I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that now, if you can explain that to people. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, uh, everything has two polarities. When we see the light at home, you know, the light electricity uh, has two polarities, positive and negative. And doesn't mean that one is good, the other one is bad, you know? It needs both of them to manifest this light that, that it comes to our home, so at night we can see. So that light, uh, that kind of concept we can say, it is for us one at the Lake Titicaca in the Andes, the feminine focus of Lake Titicaca. And the other one, the masculine, is in the Himalayas. In uh, our Andean tradition, uh, we have a word very similar to that, is Himalaya. Himalaya means like upstairs. It's mm -hmm. upstairs. Yeah, it is upstairs, you know. And the Hinalaya is uh, the masculine, so the Himalayas. Uh, of course, the names uh, of this uh, feminine polarity and the masculine later was brought by many metaphysical schools, the mystery schools, who start to talk that that's right. Even the, the Dalai Lama, you know, by 1970s, they've been talking about this uh, feminine polarity focus on Lake Titicaca. And uh, the, the, the Lama's been talking about the new pilgrimage place for this new cycle, this new era. It's the south of Peru. Of course, the mayor of Cusco then said, Cusco is the center. Of course, it's an important <laughs> center. But the hidden, the inner temple is at the Lake Titicaca. So it's all the south of Peru, you know, and Bolivia, that is the area that plays an important role for all the humanity. You are correct, that's the birthplace, even of the new cycle, the new day, you know, because this place has so many gifts. I mean, it's not only about the surface, the beauty of the lake, it's an aspect. The other temples that are in the inner world and the etheric world. The English knew as the golden temples, and one of these golden temples that is connected with the awakening of consciousness, with the expansion of consciousness, that many of the metaphysical schools, they start to call the Enlightenment Temple. The inner world temples, you know, the retreat of the solar disk, the inner world is so important. From there come the seeds when we plant. It is with the ukupacha, with the inner world. So the way how the lake opens today is incredible. You know, just a few weeks ago, we had the first group to one of the islands where nobody goes. Hmm. And the community was so happy in the Soto Island where the white stones come. And these mm -hmm. white stones and channeling, one of these informations came as the white plane of Divine Mother. 
you know, there is two very traditional stones on the lake. One is black, the other one is white. The black from Amantani and the white from this island. Normally in the old times, people used to put those stones in their, in the, in the floor of the, their, their homes, the, their gardens, and many temples, they would combine black and white stones from sacred Titicaca. So uh, there is so much, you know, uh, the, the temple that we are talking about of the solar disk also is so, is huge. The meaning of the solar disk, the retreats, the masters who are taking care of it. I mean, who are the guardians, who are, the masters in the inner world. So the, the, what does it mean the lake as a mirror of the cosmic womb, the womb of the cosmic mother, you know? Mm -hmm. It's right. all wings, you know, connected with that. So talking about uh, the sacred lake, we always are talking about the new cycle. This is a new cycle. It's a feminine cycle, but positive cycle. Of mm. course, when the situation doesn't look like this is, of course, an important awakening call, awakening calling for everybody to return to our nature. That is the spirit. It is about how we are feeding the soul, the mind, and the physical body. How we make stronger our soul to face the weaknesses. How mm. we are making strong the immune system. To, to face what we need to face because there is so much power. That means much light in our physical bodies. That means that light is love. It's in service, service to what? In service to light and it's wise. So with love, without fear, always we can activate all the cells, their own wisdom. You know, each cell is a, is a little sun, and this little sun has the same power, the same light, is the same love, the same wisdom. There is only one wisdom. That wisdom we call yache, and this word you can read from both sides, yache from left to right, from right to left, yache. So there is this possibility to bring with our own awareness the wisdom that is that light. So all light is love. All love is wise. All light is wise. So light, love, life is the same. Mm. You talked about heavy energies and needing to, at one point, and I think it's in a couple of your books too, um, it, the the uh, there's a big emotional connection with the second chakra. Um, it's it's connected to all our emotional realm, and you've talked about needing to work through some of the heavy energies with respect to water. I remember that discussion with you, and um, in my in my teachings and in my realm, um. And you just said it too. There's there's love, and and the absence of love is fear. And what we're working towards with the light, what we're working towards is to get to this place of love. But there's all of these heavy uh, lower emotions, our emotional realm that we have to work through in order to get there. And I believe what you talk about is how the water can help us. To cleanse. Can you clarify that? Am I saying things right? Sure. And that's the first quality of the light, clarity. Very important to clarify what we are talking about too. So for us, it's so important the love, service, and wisdom of Mama Kocha. Mama Kocha is the mother sea, the mother lake. Is another mother, it's like a, an assistant of the Pachamama. Mama Kocha guides us through our emotional body. She brought the emotions and the feelings. So one of the most important missions we have in our life, you know, what's the most important mission? Even it's not outside of ourselves, it's inside of us. It is about to let it go, the heavy energies, 
the heavy energies that comes, you know, from from fear, you know, came with sadness, the ones that brought us anger, and some reflects as a resentment. All those are the lowest frequencies. We are not designed. We are not designed for vibrate that law mm. that makes us sick. Right. So it's so important for us to let go all these heavy energies. What is heavy energies for us is anything that doesn't come from love. It's heavy. Because, you know, there is some heavy energies that we thought that it's very important for us. You know, when we started with fear to work very, 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 very hard in order to, to don't be poor or to, to be afraid that maybe I will not have enough. So that brings, you know, heavy energies. Sometimes mm -hmm. you sacrifice. You don't love what you are doing, but you have to do it. Working maybe 15 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours a day, you know. Mm -hmm. so, it, it, what is it? it? It is good, is it bad? No, we don't say it's good, it's bad, it's just it's heavy. And everything heavy, everything that doesn't come from love is not good. Okay? So mm -hmm. we need to let go the night in order to shine, to illuminate the new day. The biggest struggle we have in our lives is the blockages the resistance. This resistance comes from the blockages that we create in our emotional body. In the emotional body, we created this, like a being, we can say, a kucha. Kucha body is alive. All mm. the energies are alive. The refined energies and the heavenly energies are alive. And they need to eat to be alive, you know, to continue alive. And yeah. everybody wants to be alive. <laughs> heavy energy will love to be alive. But really, what does it eat is heavy energy. That's why the humans, we have that tendency to know what's wrong in the world, you know? What is, what, what we hate the most? What is the good excuse to be unhappy? Those are ways how we, how we feed the heavy energy body. If we don't find them, around us, we make those. We create mm -hmm. the heavy energy by confining, by judging, judging, you know, to ourselves and uh, to the other ones, you know. Sometimes, unfortunately, we choose the ones that are closest to us. Sometimes are our family, our colleagues, you know. Mm -hmm. So, because remember, when, when, when somebody is not comfortable with themselves, they're not comfortable with anybody. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's the other's fault. You know? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And that we, we are, in a way, we say free of guilt. But the truth is, hucha also is guilt. The real trans, the translation, literal translation of which is guilt. So the guilt is always coming from the way, what is your perception of yourself, the perception of life. And that has to do with your histories. If you don't clarify your histories, you will keep seeing it all the time. And that's the point. The past, it is not behind. The past is in front. What? We cannot stop seeing it. So when it's gone, it is when you don't see anymore, when you don't give any more power to it, when you just laugh about what you did. Somebody was asking me the other day, until when I have to deal with this heavy energy? Until you love all your histories. <laughs> so it's, it's learning to, would you say it's learning to overcome or learning to accept? Well, the, one of the most important practices, besides clarity, the other one is uh, transparency. In the transparency, we understand that life is proportional. As we have a great gift in one hand, there is some weakness in the other hand. 
Mm. Okay. Very, 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 very gifted, talented person. It's very hard. But also the heavy or the weakness is strong. So we need first to accept the, weak, the weakness, accept the heavy energies that we need to deal with. If we don't accept, it can take over. I mean, it can control us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And most of the masks of ourselves, it is just these heavy energies, you know, the fake selves that is, we use it to survive in our lives. So it's so important, so vital for us as we are entering into a new cycle and a new day to let it go those blockages so we can really shine and illuminate the new day mm. by illuminating our own paths, our own lives. So would you say that Ukapacha, which is the snake that allows us to go into the inner world, would, would that be an avenue for us to get in touch with these lower energies? And if so, can you explain how that works, working with Ukapacha? Ukapacha, you know, Uku, U, K, U, Uku is a palindrome word. That means you can read from left to right, right to left, Uku, Uku. That means whatever is inside is outside. We mm. are reflecting what is inside. And it's so important for us to learn from this power animal, the serpent that teaches us that's all about to bring out from inside. So they know the secrets for shading the skin, you know? You never mm. see an old serpent, old snake. <laughs> or old... How yeah. come? Yeah, because they are just, they don't keep for too long any of the energies that doesn't come, it's not refined, it's not from mm. the light. So this is a teaching for us that we need to move the waters that is in the, in the body. The waters that they are, they are not moving is poison. All the emotions it's inside is unhealthy. So there is so many ways, you know, clarifying, exercising, you know, bringing the out, out these waters. And also, as you said before, it has to do with the sacral chakra, the sacral eye to cleanse, to mm -hmm. clarify. Water is, is the way. You know, there is a beautiful legend about the serpents. Yakumama and Sachamama. Yeah, mm -hmm. mama, mama, they learn it's all about mm -hmm. to let it go, to give it to the mother earth. So they start to releasing, 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 and suddenly, yeah, mama start to stand up, stand up, stand up, you know. It was way too big, it went very high. But too big, start to come like an arch, and everybody could see her with seven colors. Mm. So that's the legend in the heads of the jungle about the origin of the rainbow. Mm. Such a mama was doing the same. So she saw that Yakumama went all, like become the rainbow. So she says, I don't want to do the same. She wanted to be more authentic. So she went, she went like in zigzag. So everybody could see because she was giant. I'm talking about, you know, the mothers of the mothers of the mothers of the serpents. Mm. So this one, everybody could see as the light. So if we let it go, if we use one of the most important tools we have in our hearts, that is the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. We can make it. Without right. forgiveness is a good try. Without the new interpretation, the new clarification. So with what we clarify? With, it, with our own light, the light of the inner sun, the light of our inner flame. That light is extra powerful. Why? Because it's not only your light, because there is the light of the divine mother mm -hmm. and the divine mother always has been there, always will be there. 
So always we can clarify with our own light. And that is the most precious gift. That is our strength, our own light. Yeah. So, pow so much powerful work and such challenging work. But in, in the yoga tradition, if you don't do this work, if you don't work with the heavy energies, then the light can't ascend. It can't, it can't move anywhere. So you have to find a way. Uh, so I love that you're, I love the story and, um, and how we can use the water for cleansing and the element of water. And you also mentioned the rainforest and just because this interests me and I, and it, and it has to do with the water is the Amazon is that connected to that's connected to Lake Titicaca, isn't it? Is there a tributary well, there? Well, well, you know, there is some connection with the Sunni region, the Amazon region. Sunni is the cold, and Amazon is the opposite of the cold, it's a word. There is some rivers connecting those regions. But what is interesting is there is another perspective to see it about the energetic centers, not only by the location and lines or shapes or whatever, more than the altitudes. If we start from the jungle, you know, zero meters high, and we can start going to the, the heads of the jungle, of the jungle itself, you know, there is an area where there's much, much water all the time. That is what we call that root, or, or sorry, the, the sacral, because there is water. And in these places, as the presence, the strong presence of the serpents. So, and then, you know, the highest you go, you go to the heart, like it's the Lake Titicaca. You know, it's a different way to see it. And then the other, the other way, you know, the top of the mountains will be the crown. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's by the altitude as you go up. But in terms of, uh, of water itself, you know, uh, Mama Pocha, the mother sea, is always happy to assist us. I mean, we have a beautiful practice uh, for uh, letting go, cleansing, uh, therapies, many, many ways we use. Uh, always is about what you remember. Okay, mm. you remember what happened in the childhood, uh, different ages, different moments in your life. But there is some you don't remember. Which ones? Past lives or right. your ancestors or in the womb of the mother. Mm -hmm. So the way how we do it is we go to Mama Kocha asking always divine mothers a favor and they're tangible. We can touch Mama Hocha, the lake, and we go we take off the shoes, we go, we walk into the water with a little offering, and we give permission to Mama Hocha to pull out from our system those energies that we don't remember. Okay, so Mama Hocha plays in a very strong way to pull out these mysterious energies that we don't know from where come from, you know, because once in a while we feel these weird energies. What was it, you know? So sometimes those energies come from this past life or from the lineage. So always, always the mothers are ready to help us. Mm -hmm. Some people make questions about that. How, what makes you to believe that they will assist you? What about if they are too busy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the point is this we believe that all light is in service, all love is in service. There is no love that's not in service. So it's a great pleasure for the mothers to come and assist you in your process. That's so important to ask. 
okay, to call. If we don't ask, we don't call, nothing is happening. But that is the power of the intent, the desire of your heart. And you put on the hands of the Divine Mother and all her assistants, they are always ready to come to support your process. And our destiny is really about blooming because as we move these waters that doesn't, doesn't bring nutrients, nutrients, anything, these kind of waters become poison, okay? So we need to refresh ourselves, pulling new emotions with more beautiful thoughts that mm -hmm. always starts there. Yeah. We say in Spanish, pensando bonito, thinking beautifully, everything in our lives turns out beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that um, you can ask for assistance in moving through these difficult things. You, you don't have to even potentially understand what it is or where it came from to move the energy through for healing. It's just asking for that permission and then connecting in that, in that very mindful way and from the energy in the place of love that we can move through and release a lot of this energy with, yeah. with her help. This, this is about the energies from past lives, mm -hmm. the one we don't remember, doesn't happen in this, in this lifetime. Right. But if something happens, happened in this lifetime, it is our job to pull out. It is the main practice to pull out. You right. know, we use the stones on the healings. So we pull in the stones. So usually I use hectites. People use different kinds of stones. We call kuya, heavy energy eaters. But in general, it's about pull out. And we give it to the mother, to the mother's mother earth, mother sea, or mother fire, or mother wind, or mother moon, or directly to the cosmic mother. Mm -hmm. So all the mothers are ready to assist us. Every mother loves all her creatures and all of us, we have this great opportunity now more than ever because we are getting into the new day. After of 500 years of night from 1992 to 2022, we've been experiencing the entrance to this new, new day, the new cycle that we call the Pachakuti. Mm -hmm. And this Pachakuti has a special name that the Wilkakuti. Wilka is divine, is sacred, is the light. So the return to the light, the return to the sun, the return to divine, the return to sacredness. So we return to experience light as sacred. Yeah. That, this time that we're living in um, and this, this opportunity to release these heavy energies I, I mean you don't have to look very far anywhere in the world to see the difficulties that everybody's experiencing and it's it's this shift uh into this new time and it's called by many things in many different traditions but um mostly we agree that there's this shift of energy that things are moving um, but we're being called to really work on the, the most difficult, challenging things because we have to, we have to shift and move this energy to this new time, to this energy of love. Uh, so if we don't do it now, <laughs> I mean, we're given this perfect opportunity now, all of the heaviest things are coming to light. We can use this to really work through. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think we don't have to look very far to see everybody in the world has this opportunity right now to shift and to move. So in your tradition, there's this period of time through 2022. Yes, uh, it's very important to be aware what kind of cycle we are experiencing. Uh, we had to open 
to this awareness that we are entering to a different belief. We are changing from the belief of the night into the belief of the light of the day. And it's so important to be aware that light is love. Mm -hmm. That light is in service. Each of us, everybody is in service to light, like a cell in a body. Everybody has a specific functions, but there's only one purpose, one cause to keep alive this body, mm -hmm. to improve the life. So everybody, we are experiencing big changes in different aspects of life. Of course, some of us, we are expecting the, the new normality attached to the night. You know, it, right. it will not happen, you know, if we are too attached to the night, because the most important aspect in this process is really about to be aware that we are alive. Mm -hmm. And as we are alive, we have everything we need. Mm -hmm. We right. are that light. We are the rays of the same sun shining, illuminating the new day. So how does it happen? How we manifest this light in this reality is by loving ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important contribution, to be the light. And to be the light is by loving yourself. <laughs> because if you don't love yourself, it's not possible to love Mother Earth. Right. It's not going to be easy to love our neighbors or other people that we think they are wrong, you see, because it's all about to expand that love. If you are in love, you don't judge others. And you see everybody's light. As much as you see your light inside of you, you see, everybody is illuminating. Of course, one with some resistance, but to have an opinion on how strong is the resistance of the others is your own reflection. Mm -hmm. okay? So it is about loving yourself, trusting in your inner wisdom. Doesn't have to be everything rational. In this world of the night, we made everything too rational. We talk about love, but love doesn't fit in the ways how we play in our societies. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I l and to bring it back to Lake Titicaca, the lake is the mirror, it's that reflection. It gives you that opportunity to really see the truth there inside you. Exactly. That lake brings, you know, when in the past, when they ask to the Inca that it was the ruler in Cusco, often organized pilgrimage to the sacred Titicaca. And they will ask, why you go often to the sacred Titicaca? Because it was the waka, the most important waka in the Inca territory. And he said, because I can see. Mm -hmm. And that was a great answer. Mm -hmm. Probably people will say, he can see some aspect, but the most, the most important is that awareness. I can see I am light. If you are alive, you have the big picture. If you have the big picture, you see everything is interconnected, everything is interdependent, everything is proportional, and everything is reciprocal. So this reciprocity is not only between human beings. The reciprocity is even with the stars, with the Milky Way, with the insects, with all the expressions of life. Mm -hmm. So 
even in Chester with the Mother Earth, we are an amazing, great family. You know, all the creatures that the Mother Earth loves, all they are alive, they are so precious for the Mother Earth. So the Lake Titicaca as a place of the Mother, it is, it brings us the awareness of the tenderness, the awareness of how we can bring the kuyai. Kuyai is another expression for love, okay? But that love has to do with the affection. Mm -hmm. Muna is love, but kuya is also love. But as we release the blockages, you know, we start to open ourselves to that. So more than anything, you know, it is about to clarify our histories, the blockages, and the lake or any place in the world, you can open to that by the sacral chakra, wherever you are, always. You know, sometimes we use the, the triangle of power, okay? Mm -hmm. That's love, service, and wisdom. We bring it to the sacral, mm -hmm. and then with the sea, yeah. with the river, you know, we can always let it go, the energies, or let the water come and cleanse that energetic point mm -hmm. that today is active. And we can see how unclean it is. As you see the news, there is so much, you know, going on, even in different but in circles, even in, in the religions, the priests, how much the sexual energy is, uh, it's not that clear, it's not transparent, it's not in that law, okay? Mm -hmm. So some of the elders, a long time ago, I heard that this is a place more than 500 years from the colonial period, it was hidden. Uh, we thought that we don't need to talk about it. You know, it was like a taboo. That's the place where we need to stay a little bit longer. You know, when we do the cleansing of the 11 eyes, one of the eyes, we need to stay a little bit longer. We say it's always that eye because one of the elders says, this eye has zoom. I mean, you can go closer and it's to be cleansed because we bring from the lineage sometimes, from the ancestors. Right. the energies that we keep repeating. So mm -hmm. in this new day, in the new cycle, we can cleanse for the next generation because we have the extra support of the beloved father, son, and the mothers, you know, that is they are assisting us in our process. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love all of that, Jorge. <laughs> I love all of that. You're... Um, there's just so much to dive into when we talk about uh, the second chakra and, and all of the Andean wisdom that you're sharing as well. And we could go anywhere. I, I want to divert just gently back to, um, you said Mother Moon at one point when we were talking about all the mothers. And uh, so the second chakra has a very direct link to the moon. Uh, water and the moon is all tied together. Island of the moon uh, in Lake Titicaca. Um, that place felt particularly special to me in connecting to that mother energy, that sacred feminine energy. Um, can we explore that a little bit? Well, yeah, uh, uh, next to the Sun Island, the, the, the Moon Island plays an important role in balancing both energies, you know. Uh, for all these 500 years, it was more about the Sun only, but not necessarily in the ceremonies. You can see all the ceremonies in the Andes has to do with the feminine and very little about the masculine. I, I, mm. Have you noticed that? Yeah. But when we mention it's more about, yeah. uh, more, when we mention about the Pachamama, Mama, Pachamama, Kochama, Mama Kiya, the Mother Moon. And the Mother Moon plays an important role as a 
directing the directions of the agriculture, which was very important. You know, our spirituality, it was very practical as well. The modern moon will assist us directing when planting, when harvesting, when is the best time, you know, for different products and how we can get the benefits of the I need the light that brings for us. With the light of the Father's Son, we can see much the truth. Mm. But with the light of the Mother Moon, we can see even hidden places. We can mm. see in more subtle energies, the energies that we see in the darkness. Right. Okay? So those energies are so strong as they grow hidden because we don't know how much is growing. See? So the mother moon can tell us and she can assist us to pull out. For example, when we are on the Sun Island or Moon Island around the lake, any place, we have a beautiful practice because the lake works with this with its water and the sea, in the sea we can see how it pulls the heavy energies. You know, we take some plants like a sage or, or munya, different plants, we touch our foot, you know, barefoot, touching, touching, jumps and 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 jumps. We blow to the moon. So what is the picture? The picture is that we are pulling the waters that stuck mm. and we send it to the moon. Mm -hmm. And the modern moon pulls out, and you know, you can see the power of the sea, how can move the tide and the sea, see? how move the waters. So it's so, so beautiful when we start to talk with the modern moon mm -hmm. and the ways how she comes to teach us, to remember us, and you can feel your emotions, which mm -hmm. is a very deep teaching. Yes. I have to say that visiting uh, Peru uh, and Bolivia, Lake Titicaca, also Machu Picchu, Sacred Valley, that whole trip for me in 2015 was a, a huge monumental uh, energetic shift, spiritual, enlightened um, it really, it really shifted everything for me. And I feel very strongly, I would never go there uh, again or with a group without traveling with you because there is such um, care and wisdom and, um, and just love that comes with your um, escorting and hosting of the groups. So I want to, I just want to thank you for being a part of uh, my spiritual awakening and, um, and hopefully very soon we'll be able to bring many people back um, to experience this themselves because we can talk about it all day long, but you have to be there, you have to go, you have to visit, you have to open yourself up to the energy of Pachamama and allow yourself the opportunity to really dive into to all that it has to offer. So I'm looking forward to coming back uh, soon. And is there any final things you wanna say or talk about in our discussion today about the Sacral Center, Lake Titicaca and, uh, and the Earth's womb? Well, you know, I, I just want to be grateful with the generosity of your words and the generosity of your time. You take, you know, to share with others. This is an important service, but so important, the service to yourself, to all your friends that they are connecting with you and to all our friends in different places in the world. This is just an extraordinary moment. So nowadays you can have, you know, I've been like four times already after the pandemic and I, I'm just returning in a few days to Lake Titicaca. I, a month ago, I was in Machu Picchu with a nice group 
of people from Barcelona. And, well, you know, many groups are coming and all of them, with all of them, we are experiencing the pristine energies. I mean, it is the same, but different. I mean, right. the new frequencies, it's like, it's download new codes that we can really get it. Because sometimes we think that it's all about love, all about love, all about love, but we're not loving ourselves. Mm -hmm. But now it's not easier to do this part of the journey. I mean, to rediscover ourselves, to reprogram ourselves, to rebalance ourselves, to reborn in Peru. Mm -hmm. So we believe that Lake Titicaca is the birthplace of the children of the sun. Come with us mm -hmm. to the new cycle as we reborn at the sacred Titicaca, expanding our light in Machu Picchu, enjoying the beauty of the fields of light that is Urubamba. So, you know, it, it is really a gift to the soul. This is nothing more important in life. And instead of feeding the ego, feeding the heavy energy body to feed the soul, what is what your soul wants in your life? Your soul just wants to enjoy the life. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about places where to enjoy Titicaca, Peru is extraordinary destiny to bring that light through your eyes into your system. And that helps us in many ways, in the immune system, in the nervous system, in the electric system in the body, in the emotional body, in the mental body, you know, in many aspects, we are solar beings, all of us. So this is the culture that welcomes you for this new cycle. Hmm. Well, I can't wait to get back down there again, and I'm hoping very, very soon and uh, to explore again. So thank you so much for taking this time. I'm so appreciative of your time. You're a very busy man, and this was an incredible discussion that we were able to have today. And next time we're gonna have this in person. Is that a deal? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.